Good morning, everybody. And uh, for those of you who have made it on time, I appreciate it. And um, uh, thank you, Horeba, for um, inviting me for this session. And I also thank the organizers of APPI for uh, accepting the um, uh, accepting me for this session and uh, <clears throat> that the topic that I've been given to cover is on digital hematology so I'll be mostly talking about my experience at Anand Diagnostics and how we use the digital morphology in our routine work and um, uh, just a bit just a quick question how many of you all were there for Dr. Sujay's uh, session yesterday morning Okay, so you already have an idea of what we do. So that's almost similar to what he would have presented is what I'm going to tell, talk about right now. <coughs> okay, the intent of the talk plan per se would be morphology, digital image analysis in hematology. What is it and how does it work? So all of you have an idea, right? Or is there, I mean, you all know what digital hematology is. Do you all have any experience with digital hematology? Do you all have any notions about it? Oh, I wouldn't want to let go of my microscope. Is that the first thing that comes to your mind? Yes, no? Do you want to talk to me? Do you like me? Do you not like me? <laughs> yeah, so exactly. So I'm asking you, what do you mean by digital hematology? What do you know about, what do you think about digital hematology? Okay. On the computer rather than under the microscope. Yeah, so that's pretty much what, uh, as he just mentioned, we are probably trying to see the images um, that we see under the microscope on the computer instead of under the microscope. So uh, the thought would be why, I mean, why do it? What, what's wrong with the microscope? We have such good microscopes. We have the time. We, um, you know, why should we actually spend um, uh, and make an effort to view it under the com uh, on the computer instead of the microscope? That would, be the, that would be the first thought, right? And I too had that. I think initially, um, I've been with Anand for about eight years now. And about three years ago when Dr. Sujay and I were discussing and he said he's planning to get cellavision. So the first thought that came to my mind was I didn't even know what cellavision was at that time. And then when I browsed, I thought, okay, but why? You know, we have microscope, we are happy with microscope. Why would we want to view it on the computer? Is it going to add value? And of course, at that time, I did not get an answer because I wasn't using it. And then of course, cellavision came in and we started using it. And then of course, my feelings towards the whole thing changed. And that's exactly what I'm going to tell you now. And how does it fit into the routine workflow and what are its benefits? So that will be pretty much what I'll be talking about in the next 20 to 30 minutes. We all know that peripheral blood smears. How many of us over here in this room report peripheral blood smears? Almost all of us, right? We know that in any hematopath lab, about 80, 70 to 80 percent of our workload is CBCs and complete hemogram. And we know the challenges. It's a very basic test. Anybody and everybody asks for a CBC irrespective of whether the patient has a leukemia or lymphoma or the patient has uh, just a fever or the patient um, is here for a master health check. It could be just any reason, but then we get a CBC. And sometimes, and many times rather, we do not know, we, don't, we do not have all the details of the patient. So when we're actually seeing a CBC, we don't know what the background is. We don't know what they're looking for, what they're asking for. We may be from a standalone lab. We may be in a hospital-based lab, or we may be uh, based anywhere. But we may not always get the information that we want when we are seeing the CBC, which pretty much leaves us with the patient sample and us to crack the code. And that's not easy. And I know that all of you are with me on this. If the patient has thrombocytopenia, we do not know whether they're evaluating dengue or the patient has always had thrombocytopenia as a part of some congenital or inherit, inherited macrothrombocytopenia, or, what, or the patient is on some chemotherapeutic drugs. So we, keeping that in mind, while that is one reality, the other reality is CBCs have to be reported stat. We have to give the report within two hours, maximum two hours. Otherwise, you know, the, there is a bad name for the um, lab that you, know, you were not able to deliver a CBC on time. So we are always caught between balancing the turnaround time and the quality of our reports. Agreed? Very good. 
So what is the routine, a conventional workflow in a hematopath lab? If we have a five-part cell counter, what happens typically is we run all the samples through the five-part cell counter. Or if it's a three-part, then it's a three-part. If it is a five-part, then depending on the flags and our comfort level, level with the analyzer, we decide whether or not to make the smear based on some guidelines and slide review criteria. But if we don't have that, we have only a three-part, then we have to make smears for all of them. And that could be 10 samples or 20 samples or even 200 samples, depending on the kind of workload that we have. So once the slides are made, we have to see them. Now, what do we... <coughs> sorry. So what do we do is we view them under the microscope. Typically, if we're looking at something that most of the cell counters will tell us what we have to look for. Are we looking at something abnormal in the RBCs? Are we looking at something abnormal in the WBCs or the platelets? So depending on the clues that we get on the cell counter, we pay attention to that particular aspect on the smear under the microscope. And many a time it is to do with WBCs, in which case we have to ideally do about 300, 400, 500 cell DC. How many of us actually do even 100 cell DC for every slide that we put under the microscope? Except for Dr. Parag. Okay, very good. We have a lot of them. So it's, um, while we have people like yourself doing the 100 cell DC, which is I think the best, it's the most accurate way of reporting. It is a challenge because again, we are faced with a workload and with the turnaround time. And uh, also there is an issue of inter-observer variability, what I might find as a mono, think as a monocyte, my colleague might think as a transformed lymphocyte, and I think that problem can never resolve on its own. So the idea is to bring in a certain level of automation at this step. Again, does it mean that we don't want the pathologist to report? No. Let me tell you at the beginning, and then I'll keep telling you till the end, that the pathologist has the same role to play till the end, even if we try to replace this microscope with an automated digital morphology analyzer. So how do we do that? What is this coming to the basic question of what is automated digital cell morphology analyzer is basically a software which is trained to read the smear. How does it happen is multiple images from the blood smears are captured and the images are analyzed on an AI platform by the machine learning through deep neural network. And the analyzed results are available in the form of numerical data with images that can be viewed on a computer. Well, this is all very theoretical and it's all very engineer-like language, which is what it is. So we have, we are in an AI world where a lot of things, including when we go on Facebook, we see that we, uh, you know, um, try and um, shop for a particular type of commodity. And then whichever site you go, you find that commodity is kind of chasing you, whether it's a Fab India or whether it's some other product. Because again, it is through some kind of a learning mechanism. So um, while that is one thing that's happening, what we're using the artificial neural network is we are trying to recapitulate what happens with us as human beings. Our brain does a certain amount of work all the time. When we're seeing another microscope, we're looking for certain things, we're analyzing it, and then we're reporting. So we are trying to recapitulate that model using a computer software. It has a hardware because we have to push the slides somewhere. And then it has a software which does the hard work of what our brain does. And um, the software is what uses the artificial neural network. And this is the cell vision that we have in our lab. This, this is the hardware that you can see over here. This is the hardware um, that you can see. And and we send the slides through this rack over here once it is stained. Uh, I need to tell you that these smears are all automated uh, smears, which means that the, um, the, the smearing and the staining happens through automation, which is connected to a blood cell counter. And we push those smears into these. And then in, in about five minutes time, we get this on the computer. So in that five minutes, what really happens is there's a microscope which is cased inside this particular um, uh, area. And there is also a camera. And the microscope starts moving in a particular pattern. And it starts clicking a lot of images. Those images are then trained. This is an already trained software. So those images are analyzed within the software. And finally, it gives us a result of this sort. 
So uh, just to quickly tell you what happens is when it captures the images, there is a protocol for WBCs, there is a protocol for RBCs where it tries to find, it does what we do. It a nice area, even though we have a big smear, we don't look at the complete smear. We look at only one area which is most suited for our eye to comprehend and our brain to understand. So we go to that area and then we do fine adjustment. We try to focus it. And then we extract features. Like for instance, we know that eosinophils have um, coarse uh, orange granules, whereas neutrophils have azurophilic, uh, azurophilic granules and basophils have basophilic granules. So all those kind of interpretational aspects come into play. And then we classify, classify using, using either a DC counter or we just classify in our head as to how many of such cells we are seeing. And that's what happens when it tries to find for a WBC monolayer. It starts at a certain point and then it ends at a certain point. Um, and in this area, it starts capturing a lot of images. While it is doing so, it um, also makes sure that it doesn't miss out the crucial area. So it follows a certain pattern. So there is a robotic mechanism which ensures that it starts at a certain uh, point and ends at a certain point so that all the WBCs in this area are captured. And then it extracts the features, which I just told you. It does so in 10x objective, in 60 uh, times magnification, as well as under oil immersion. <clears throat> and then it starts focusing. So from blur to the most crisp images we have, it, seg it does what is called segmentation. That is, when the cell is in focus, a segmentation is performed, and more than 300 features are calculated. And then it extracts based on certain features, which I just again mentioned to you. So this is the ne neural network that all of you may have at some point in time seen. I'm sorry about this. So what typically happens, typically happens is different cells, the input goes into the neural network and a lot of learning, machine learning happens and finally we get the output. So this is how the WBC page looks on when I view it on my computer. So I get all the WBCs that have been clicked. I get a, um, a classified, a pre-classified or a classified um, pattern, which means that all the neutrophils go into one bucket, all the monocytes into another bucket, and eosinophils into another bucket. And in the left side of the panel, I find the entire the entire list of WBCs, the number of cells that it has counted, and how many of each type it has counted with, e with an image for each of them. A similar thing happens for the RBCs as well, where RBCs again not only um, get captured, but they also get classified. Now, we know how many RBCs there are on a smear, so all of us don't always get to count the RBCs. And sometimes we need to give a grading of anisopoikilocytosis. And then what I might find is 2 plus, somebody else might think is 3 plus. And then there is no clear cut system which we um, are able to follow. Rather, bec uh, it's because there's a lot of subjectivity involved in it. So again, RBC analysis, similar thing happens. A lot of images are captured at different magnifications. I'll skip through this. But ultimately, what you need to know is about 35 images are grabbed for the RBCs and about 2,500 RBCs are analyzed. And what it gives us is this. Again, it chooses another area for RBCs where the RBCs are just touching each other so that there is no overlap, which is what we would also do when we view. And a decision tree is used for the RBC, RBC pre-characterization. And again, using the neural network, we get um, a, an RBC output like this. Now, RBCs can be viewed in uh, two types of modes. One is you just see like how you see it under the smear. So we have the entire thing and we can do whatever we want. We can just decide to semi-quantify the anisopoikilocytosis. Or it gives us an RBC differential where each of, this, each of the type, say it has extracted about 2,500 RBCs, it would have classified them based on its own intelligence of what it's learned into target cells and schistocytes, helmet cells and whatnot. And another beauty uh, or an additional feature here is it also gives us a percentage of the 2,500 RPCs that have been captured, which is again objectifying the subjectivity that has all along existed. So um, 
we cannot fare worse than what we're doing in microscope. We can only fare the same or we can do better. That is what I'm trying to tell you over here. <clears throat> this is again um, a case where there are a lot of stomatocytes and if you see here, I'm not sure if it's clear, but then stomatocytes have been um, flagged. And again, another view of the RBCs with a lot of stomatocytes. Again, you can see it in the context. Now, if I click only on stomatocytes, only the stomatocytes on that particular FOV shows up. And um, or the same stomatocytes, I want to see it in the form of a group. So I can see it that way as well. So it just allows you to play around a little bit. And image quality, as I think most of you all would agree, is really good. So the chances of you not being happy with viewing on the computer is extremely low. Um, so these are the things that it gives us an estimate of the size, it gives us an estimate of the shape and the inclusions of the RBCs as well. Um, in all this, I need to tell you that whether it's WBCs or RBCs, the machine does make mistakes. So it's not like the machine is al always going to be accurate. But as a pathologist, for me, I'm not extremely worried about how, perf how well performing the machine is. I'm more interested in viewing the images in a certain manner so that everything is there in front of me, allowing me to use my discretion to report. So that is what ultimately is the aim of using this. And um, also, if you have some interesting images, you can always sh um, save it in a library, which can be used later, either for teaching purpose or maybe like a seminar like today. <coughs> and this is how so if I, go to, if I go to a schistocyte, like we know that schistocyte is a very, uh, not very, but you know, a slightly controversial topic because what I think is that schistocyte may not um, actually fit into the, we have guidelines for that. We have the um, ICLH guideline for how the schistocyte is supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, named and classified. It should be totally, um, it should not have a pallor at all and it should have two sharp edges mostly in the form of a helmet shape and also they should be the predominant feature on the smear when we're looking at it and in the context of schistocytes when we see microspherocytes we have to count them as a schistocyte so these are a few things that i know about schistocytes so we, we can always go to a cell library and see the reference cells like here is a reference for um, inclusions and um, the grading of RBCs, we can set our own threshold. For instance, if I follow a certain guideline and I follow a certain um, journal for uh, saying that this is a threshold for one plus up to you know 10% and then 10 to 15% is two plus and 15 to 20% is three plus, I can set it back end in my software so that the gradation happens accordingly. Platelets, as of now, the version that we have does not have any kind of an artificial intelligence based um, analysis of platelets, it just gives us <coughs> the number of platelets that there are uh, in every grid. We can we have about nine grids. We can just see how many platelets there are. I think if the cell counter is giving adequate number of platelets and the platelet histogram and the WBC histogram is fine, I wouldn't even I wouldn't really worry about platelets so much. It's only when there is an abnormal flag for platelet, when the WBC histogram is abnormal, there is a suspected clump. Uh, there are suspected clumps or clots. That is when I think I would be worried about platelets. And I think this software doesn't really help in platelets because we find that many times when there are fibrin clots and clumps, it sits right at the corner and that doesn't get covered uh, during the analysis. So there is, a, there is a chance, especially if we haven't used a vacuum a system of collecting sample, uh, the chances of having clumps and fibrin clots are high and we could be missing it if we view it under the um, on the computer. So I think that way, uh, for all platelet counts of thrombocytopenia with abnormal flags, we do view the uh, smear under the microscope. So the same workflow, um, I have tried to replace to a large extent with the digital morphology analyzer. <coughs> Just to show you a, a few cases of what we do when we have cases. This is a case of a five-year-old male with anemia. For two years, jaundice, splenomegaly, gallstones, and his CBC came to us. This is uh, how the CBC looked. There was a chronic hemolysis with reticulocytosis, and the MCHC was on the borderline high. We saw a lot of spherocytes, and again, you know, spherocytes, 
uh, in the context of hereditary spherocytosis or even autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we would like to know the percentage or the magnitude or the level of spherocytes that there are. It's one of the tools um, it, with this, you know, it becomes easy. Like for instance, in this case, there was about 23% uh, spherocyte spherocytes, the DCT was negative and then of course we did further evaluation with osmotic fragility and um, EMA dye binding by flow and it was positive for hereditary spherocytosis. Another case of fever with query TMA, we obviously saw a lot of schistocytes, they clearly were schistocytes and quantifying schistocyte again, I'm sure that inter-observer variability and intra-observer variability is also very high. So this is something that would help us quantify schistocytes way better than we probably used to. Um, if you see these flags over here, these were classified as um, non schistos sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so all of these were classified as schistocytes and we got about a certain percentage, I think it's about 15% schistocytes. And this is again just a case of, I'm just showing more and more of pictures, just show you the different case scenarios where, um, uh, well, the way it looked on digital analyzer. This is a case of hemolytic anemia where we were able to grade the anaiso and poikilocytosis. Some sickle cells, again, only sickles. Some targets, targets and sickles. I think this was a sickle cell anemia. And some elliptocytes. A nucleated RBCs does come in the WBC channel, in the WBC uh, display. And again, counting NRBCs, sometimes, many times I think um, uh, our cell counters give us a good estimate of NRBCs, but we need to humanly ver verify them and we need to also quantify them. So this again, again becomes easy. Case of dimorphic anemia, you can see the um, uh, dimorphic histogram of RBCs over here. This was from the cellar vision. This was a case which was sent to us for QBC for malaria. And there was so much of background, whatever you call it, you know, disturbance, all these dots, which didn't really look like um, ring forms, but then, you know, they were disturbing. I don't know what they were, but we anyway made a smear and we saw that they were actually Howell Jolly inclusions. So this is just an example to show you that inclusions are also picked up. And this was a case of malaria. This is a gametocyte over here. Some transformed lymphocytes. All of these are gametocytes, except I think maybe one uh, giant plate here. The remaining are all gametocytes, which were classified as misclassified or wrongly classified by the analyzer as a um, giant platelet. But um, the good thing is, it was there for me to see and reasonably quantify and also conclude that it was a case of parasitic infestation. <coughs> and this was a case of, this is a known case of MDS. Um, how many of you all, can anybody tell me what's wrong with this WDF plot? So we know how the WDF looks, right? Can somebody tell me something that looks a little abnormal over here? Sir, you tell me. The neutrophils have shifted one log to the left. So if the neutrophils has shifted to the left, um, are we inclined to think that they are hypogranular? Yes. So this is a case of MDS, with a known case of MDS. We see the washed out appearance of uh, the cytoplasm of the neutrophils. There was also an occasional, there was just like one blast on that particular smear and uh, some inclusion like, I don't know if these are Shediac, uh, Higashi granule or whatever, I don't know, some inclusion. And uh, the patient also had stomatocytes. She's 89 years old. Uh, her sample keeps coming um, to us every month for a blast count and uh, morphology review. She's on drugs. I think maybe her stomatocytes is as a result of um, some drug induced change. This is a case of hemolytic anemia. Of course, fever and hemolytic anemia for evaluation. Uh, it was a case of leukemia with some ore rods. It was clearly an AML which was non M3. We did immunophenotyping. And another case, again, can anyone tell me something over here? I'm not even sure if you're all listening to me. 
Yeah. Yeah, okay, very good. Thank you. So tell me what's wrong with this WDF plot? Yeah, so what is this called? It's called something. This is abnormal, right? So what does this signify? This is the side fluorescence. So we have high fluorescent population of li probably lymphocytes. And when do we get high fluorescent lymphocytes? Viral, viral fever? Dengue? <coughs> So this was, uh, these are just a few cases. This is on Coulter. Yeah. So these were the transformed lymphocytes that was causing that population. Um, in, inside fluorescence and, so the WDF plot or uh, when you're using flow cytometry, we're using certain dye which causes um, increased binding of the dye to the RNA, which is what happens in viral fever, and that is why we get that population. And this is what we saw on the digital analysis, and this was, of course, positive for NS1. This is a pretty image that I wanted to share of a case of platelet satellitism. And this was a case of sepsis. We find a lot of, this was culture positive, <coughs> a lot of um, vacuations and uh, all of this is fine if our smear is fine. So clearly, we there is there is a, a clause to all this. That is, your smear has to be fine. It has to be dried properly, stained properly, and smeared properly. So which again brings us to want to to requiring uh, or the need for automation even at smearing level and improper drying can cause so much of interference uh, this is just another uh, example um, of course it's not yet completed but this product since about two three years we've been working I, i've been sort of um, consulting with them uh, they are also there they are a, a indian startup company which is doing very something very similar to seller vision and uh, here also we've done a lot of uh, correlation studies and I think um, maybe in a few months time we'll have this product out, something that is affordable by most labs. I think that's one more thing that people need to think about is not every lab is going to, while we sell this so much in terms of our, um, uh, conceptually sell this so much, it should be affordable for everybody to be able to use it and I think that is the ground reality. Um, this is just to show you that there is uh, there are upcoming products of similar sort um, uh, in the Indian market and it's also doing really well. Um, it's the same thing, um, I don't want to repeat myself, but just to tell you that using the technology, if we have people uh, kind of working on this and if labs start using them, I think it would definitely be the way forward. And um, so, uh, why is it useful? I mean. Finally, I'm convinced that it's useful because the quality of images allows me to report quickly. So everything, all my 100 WBCs or 200 WBCs that I want are in front of me. The NRBCs, I'm sorry, the RBCs, the platelets, everything is in front of me. The cell counter, um, histograms and the scatter plots are in front of me. So I don't have to really spend too much time and effort reviewing every smear. Um, and also it allows us to kind of discuss amongst each other, whether it's the colleagues, um, my colleagues, or with even the technologists, it acts as a teaching tool. And um, if it's a three-part hematology analyzer, where uh, which many people have, it could, uh, I mean, it could be much more useful as like an augmentation tool. And remote access is again one advantage of this. And inter and intra laboratory collaboration can be better. I think that is what Dr. Prakash will be uh, taking you um, uh, through. And archive of images for later use and traceability of results at individual cell level. You now, uh, we have body, uh, body fluid analysis mode also on this. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take. Yeah. Um, 
I got it. Right. So there are two things. One is when the software gets installed, we buy the software. For instance, Sysmix is our distributor and Cellavision is the software. So when they install it, there is already a library uh, which they have made for schistocytes, for target cells, for lymphocytes, whatever it is. But then I may be experiencing a certain, uh, within my lab, I may have certain standards. And I may want to keep that for reference. I can, I can add to that population. So I can create my own library uh, for future use and keep it as a reference so that even my colleagues in future um, or my, uh, our technologists within the laboratory will be able to use it. Right. <clears throat> I think the green is when there are no such cells. The red is when uh, it, it's, yeah, it's flagged. Right. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. So what we do is our workflow just as I showed you. Yes, so if uh, we have example is 100 um, uh, uh, CBCs and uh, we uh, have a slide review criteria that makes us do 45 smears or 35 smears depending on the season. So all those 35 get into this except if it is a single platelet and it is flagged and there is no delta check and um, what I'm trying to say is if I'm trying to look for clots, I ask them to bypass this step and give it directly to us so that we don't waste time. We look at the cornermost area, the last um, segment of the smear. Yeah. So we have about four dongles with us. So every computer needs a dongle. And we are about three uh, hematopathologists in our uh, lab. All of us have access to this. All of us follow this for the routine work. And there is one which is stationed next to the instrument, uh, which is where the technologist reviews it. So as of now, the technologist doesn't review it because there is no audit trail available. So once it's signed out, it's signed out. So if the technologist signs out, then it'll be on him. So uh, we've not yet started doing that. The technologist only sees um, uh, and passes on. Um, I mean, we get the list as soon as we open our uh, software, uh, the user interface. We get a list of slides that are getting scanned. As and when they get scanned, we click on it, we see it, and then we sign out the report. Yeah. Um, I think you should ask this mix. I don't know. I know it's a lot, but I don't know how much it is. We'll keep this. We'll keep the scientific, not commercial, because I'm not here to do that. Interpretation of it, sir. Um, a cell counter works either based on impedance or flow cytometry. So there is a certain principle. The principle of this and that are different. Yeah. A cell counter has its role. It will continue to have its role. If we are smart enough to use all the information that a cell counter gives, then we are smart. And the next step is we will still have the 10% or 20% or 30% of the slides that need to be seen as a pathologist. That is where this comes into picture. Yeah, only if you use this five-part differential, yeah. how you pick up uh, those uh, cases which need to be... So I think Dr. Parag will talk more about it, but the different analyzers, you have to understand your machine. If I have a coulter, I have to understand my coulter in and out. I have to understand my Sysmix in and out. I have to understand my Horiba in and out. Each of them is, all of them are capable of giving you a lot of information. It's a question of whether you're learning them, you're learning your machine. Because what I would talk about, now I spoke about WDF plot, which was Sysmix. But I don't expect people who don't use Sysmix to know it. However, if you are using Sysmix, you better know it. Because you are otherwise not going to know what you have to look for on a smear. That is, it's as simple as that. It's giving you clues, it's giving you information. You have to be, um, have a relationship with your uh, analyzer enough to know what clues to look for on the smear. 
it's as simple if a malaria parasite many people keep saying oh you know this doesn't give malaria parasite every machine on wbc histogram will give you some information on uh, malaria it's only up to you whether you want to see it note it remember it and then use it the next time thank you thank you thank you sir